All right, so I, I think every, uh, every sinus course should have a talk on complications. Um, it is now my turn to give this talk. And, you know, from a standpoint of, I've been, this year I'm going to turn a half a century, and I've been doing this a really long time. I've done an enormous amount of sinus cases, and we all aim for perfection, but the reality is we're all going to have complications, okay? You know, you can try and minimize those complications, and you can try and minimize the adverse outcomes of complications, but regardless, you will have complications. And, you know, when it comes, to, I'm in a resident training center, so like when you train residents, uh, I say, what's the number one rule in my OR? Like, yeah, don't get in the orbit of the skull base, right? So if you can not get in the orbit of the skull base, we can pretty much do everything and you can you can mitigate everything that, uh, that occurs. But the orbit and the skull base are really the most feared complications of sinus surgery. Um, Let's talk about orbit first. So these are going to be penetration of the orbital wall, right? So orbital hemorrhage, emphysema, or orbital emphysema, which is basically when they blow their nose after surgery, uh, and you've got a crack in the lamina. Optic nerve injury, extraocular muscle injury. Um, there's a lot of litigation around this sort of thing. Um, and there's different ways that you can try and avoid uh, uh, these types of complications. Um, these lacrimal duct, duct obstruction, and then you know, when a, with an orbit, it's usually contralateral side of the handedness of the surgeon, and that has to do with where the orbit is in relationship to where their their um, their dominant side is. Orbital complication rates have been uh, predicted here, 2013, 2017, uh, about 0.04 percent. But I point this out that really, from a, from a litigation standpoint, this is one of the most um, litigious areas within ENT. And diplopia is the most common medical complaint with these, with these litigious, uh, um, uh, with these lawsuits. Permanent deficits and having to go under, undergo additional surgery also uh, play into that. And so when we talk, when I talk to residents, I'm like, look, common reasons for orbital viola violation, you gotta review that scan ahead of time, identify medial wall an anomalies. Um, and a lot of times it has to do with the, the vascularity and the bleeding during the surgery. So you want to do things to help with bleeding so that you can actually keep your orientation. You got to identify landmarks. Um, scarring from previous surgery can play into, play into roles. And then, you know, common sense things like making sure that they're... they're uh, their coags are okay. You want to stop any anticoagulation or antiplatelet medications ahead of time. Um, Everyone seems to be on Eliquis nowadays, right? So it's one of those things that can really um, run into problems, especially in an emergency situation. Review CT scan, like identify those things that could create problems. And we'll go over some of this, but atelectatic unfundibulum. Um, what's the medial orbital wall rate? Right? Was there erosion? Is there a prior dehiscence? And then, you know, where's that optic nerve? Where are those sphenoid complications? Location, anterior and posterior um, ethmoid arteries. Eric Weitzel from San Antonio did this um, uh, preoperative sinus CT kind of scoring or, or prop protocol to actually say, hey, let's review every scan in a systematic fashion. I really like this close um, this close protocol that he has. And it basically is like identifying the height of the cribriform, you know, looking at the lamina and those those potential orbital issues. Are there nodi cells? What's going on in the sphenoids? Is there a hiss and carotid artery? Um, where's the ethmoid arteries that hang down on a partition? And you know, from an avoiding orbital complications standpoint, it really comes down to where are you navigating that eye, right? So removal unsent process, uh, lamina propitia dehiscence, again, anterior ethmoid artery, a nodi cell. When you remove the unsented process, this is one of the common areas that people run into problems, especially with like silent sinus syndrome. Um, with the techniques, there's the unsented window through cut instruments, soft tissue shaver, sickle knife. But really, uh, the technique that I like, and I'll go over, is the Parsons technique, which is essentially using a, a ball tip probe and a backbiter. Uh, concerns like prior orbital decompression, this is a common issue. Uh, if they've got uh, max ray sinus mucoceles here and they've got or orbital fat right up in the, the infundibulum here. And then the silent sinus syndrome is really a classic example. Um, here's an example of um, someone trying to take that unsented off and, and basically penetrating and cutting the medial rectus. And again, this is going to end up in a, in a lawsuit type of situation. Anterior ethmoid artery, everyone knows that this is a really common area where you can get retraction ethmoid artery into the orbit causing a retroorbital hematoma. 
You should identify on the preoperative CT scan the junction of superior oblique and medial rectus. Um, Kennedy used to, we used to call this Kennedy's nipple uh, as it comes out and, and that nipple effect over here, that anterior ethmoid runs behind that supraorbital ethmoid cell. So identifying that intraoperatively is a good idea. Um, we do divide this and we take care of it in certain instances, uh, obviously like tumors, things like that. But usually what we want to do is divide it and cauterize it in the mid point of it. You don't want to do it up against the orbit because then it can retract and, and into the orbit and cause problems. Um, classic anode cell and you've got the optic nerve kind of hanging out in this left side anode cell um, looking at that, how that pushes the sphenoid down. And then, of course, intraoperative avoidance, right? So hypotensive anesthesia, the Parsons technique, as I mentioned, the lust probe backbiter, early identification of that orbit, navigating that orbital wall, making sure that you identify your landmarks. Um, leave the eyes exposed during the surgery. So you know, this is, doesn't mean like you're sitting there with the eye exposed. It just means that you can actually palpate the eye. You have the face exposed, and you, know, you can cover it with tape or you can cover it with a tegaderm, but you can palpate it and continue, you know, inspect it if you're, if you're concerned about anything. Early detection is critical, so uh, fat exposure, you know, most of the time it's fine, right? So if there's a, if there's a dehiscence in the wall from uh, dissection, either with sharp instruments, but the microdebrider is really where people run into problems. You can suck up a medial rectus so quickly with a microdebrider. And so the, the technique that I teach my residents, and I know some of you weren't in the lab yesterday, but I call it a crunch and munch. And so my residents use a sharp instrument to cut the tissue. And so that way you're controlling where you're going. And then we use a microdebrider only to clean up those part, those crun crunched tissue that's there. And what that does is you don't navigate, you don't push into the tissue with a microdebrider. And that really mitigates the potential issues in terms of trying to get, if you got into the orbit, um, you're not going to suck up a bunch of fat and muscle. Um, from a manipulation or, or removing fat standpoint, you really don't want to do that. You just want to, um, you can proceed with the surgery as long as you, you, know, you identify that the, the eye is okay. I really don't like any sort of attempt to shrink fat. That's a really bad idea. Minimize the nasal packing in that scenario. Um, and then avoid nose blowing and sneezing because they will get uh, orbital emphysema post-op in that scenario. Retroorbital hematoma, signs, decreased globe compliance, um, proptosis, lid edema, eyelid ecchymoses. Uh, you know, one of the humbling things about giving this talk is I like to, I will talk about the, some of the complications that I've had and, and also how I manage them. And, and one of the things of a retroorbital hematoma is this can be very, um, very, very nervous and nerve wracking, right? You only have about 60 to 90 minutes to decompress the eye before you can, um, you develop permanent blindness. Uh, afferent pupillary defect is something to, to note if you've got some eye swelling, and, um, and that's, I'll, I'll go over that in a second. The timing, if you have like a small capillary leak, it's a little slow onset. Sudden onset is the anterior posterior ethmoid artery particularly. The relative afferent uh, pupillary defect, obviously, when you're, you do the swinging light exam, and on the affected side, when you swing the light over, you actually get a dilation instead of a constriction. And that means that you're actually compromising the visual pathways and you're not able to, to, di you're not able to constrict. And that is a really important aspect of, of uh, looking at uh, how, how soon until, or are we having a problem that we really need to decompress. And then, you know, from a management standpoint, retroorbital hematoma, you want to control any epistaxis if it's happening intraoperatively. These are some of the medical things you can do. The reality is, is, is lateral canthotomy and cantholysis is really important technique to know. And in courses like this, it's actually a good idea if you're doing cadaver dissection to try and do this if you've never done it before. Um, I actually have had two orbital issues where I've had to do a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis myself in 15 years. Um, and it's super humbling, but I was able to get control of those situations and patients did well. So um, ophthalmology consult, it's nice to have a tono pen around. The problem is tono pens are inaccurate over 30 millimeters of, of uh, mercury. So, and, and you know, usually people can hang out at 30 millimeters of mercury and be okay. Uh, but if you're above 30 millimeters of mercury, it's, it's really, that's kind of the threshold where you're thinking, okay, it's time to get some pressure off the eye. 
Let's uh, remove any nasal packs that are in because a lot of times that can happen if you have a uh, nasal pack or a, or a, a non-latex glove finger wrapped. Uh, we, we actually do these sponges with a non-latex glove finger and they can be up against the orbit. And if, you're, if you've got a exposed orbital fat and they're bleeding around it, it can bleed into the eye and the, the pack can prevent your ability to um, have that blood extravasate from the eye. And so pulling that pack out in that scenario will help decrease the pressure. Canthotamine cancellasis, as I mentioned, and you could do a medial orbital wall decompression, but really this is the, the key. And, and canthotomy is, um, is something that's actually quite simple. You can uh, get some pressure reduction with a canthotomy alone, but I highly recommend going ahead and proceeding with an inferior cantholysis. And that's where you, you do that, you bring the, um, the scissors lateral and you cut to bone and then you pick up and you can see this uh, this little tweezers I'm picking up or the, this in the picture you're picking up on this you'll feel like a it's tense like a guitar string and then you cut down and you'll feel it release and that's when you know you've got you've done an adequate inferior cantholysis and this can actually lower the pressure about 30 millimeters of mercury when you proceed with that inferior cantholysis um, this is a patient who actually, had a balloon dilation procedure, and the balloon actually uh, had gone into the eye and, and dilated, um, and the patient had APD visual loss in the, this happened outside, and, um, and they went ahead with a, um, inferior cantholysis and stuff, but, but actually they waited too long, and the patient ended up having permanent visual loss. And, and so it's really important to, to do that quickly. High volume intraorbital saline, I, I did mention I was going to talk about my complications. This is a, a case where the old hydro debrider, which people were using to clean fungus and whatnot out of sinuses, um, uh, this was reported on a complications website and basically the, the whole volume of the saline went into the eye. Now that can cause problems just like an orbital hematoma. And I'll tell you, we'll tell you about my situation where we uh, in, we have AFS patients, or allergic fungal sinusitis patients, and we flush out the fungus from the sinus. And I had a patient who I, I flushed 60 cc's of saline up in the frontal and kind of didn't see like a bunch come out. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And it was at the end of the case. And then patient woke up, goes to, goes to recovery. I, I go to talk to the family. And then I get a, a page from the nurse saying, oh, patient can't see of his eye. And I go in, and it wasn't like he was proptotic. He was tense, right? So his eye was really tense. And what had happened is I had irrigated 60 cc's of saline into the orbital compartment. And that compartment was basically now um, under extreme pressure. And so I did a lateral canthotomy, cantholysis, took him back to the OR, did a medial orbital wall cut, decompression, got his pressure down. And um, he woke up perfect vision. And so it was a perfect example of basically taking that seriously, going in, it's okay to do a canthotomy, canthalysis, people heal really well, um, go ahead and address the injury, make sure it's, it's very, you know, make sure it's uh, appropriate and, and manage it appropriately. So extraocular ocular muscle injury, um, typically history of prior orbital trauma with, um, with the dehiscent lamina, these are, these are important things. Medial rectus is the most common muscle taken. Uh, viable muscle can be repaired by ophthalmology, but usually these are debrider injuries, and so they're they're quite uh, extensive. There is one technique that can. This is a perfect example. This patient's had a medial rectus removed, and you can see the the orbital hem, orbital the orbital dehiscence here. Um, my oculoplastic surgeon wrote up uh, his experience with fascia, fascia lata graft fixation, and uh, this is a way to treat extropia, but it doesn't replace the muscle, so they can get better. Uh, you know, double vision, but, but it doesn't really fix double vision in a lateral dimension. Everyone is probably familiar with this picture. This is Dr. Kennedy's uh, picture of a, a physician's wife who, who had sinus surgery in the early days of FES, and um, the physician cut both optic nerves when she woke up, and she woke up blind. Um, really important to make sure that doesn't happen. And then if you're, you think you're having a bad day, this was uh, a, an enucleation during an endoscopic sinus surgery, this patient had no preoperative sinus disease, and the op note had said, oh, well, uh, there was some funny-looking polyps in the max ray sinus, um, when, and, and they had placed a debrider through the medial orbital wall 
and essentially debrided the entire orbital contents. Um, and again, preoperative scan, no disease. So this is a, <laughs> this is a really rough, rough day, right? So um, it, it is important to know what your indications are. You know, is there something that's abnormal here? Why am I, why am I doing this procedure? And then, of course, you know, identifying those, those landmarks that are really important. Skull-based complications, the most common things are CSF leak, of course, but low skull base, short posterior ethmoid. Everyone's familiar, familiar with the ethmoid roof configurations, so I'm not going to go into that in extreme detail because um, I'd like to get to a couple cases. But skull base dehiscence is common, and it, in my area of, of the country, we have a lot of allergic fungal sinusitis where there's, cold, where there's a lot of dehiscence. And so these are things that you need to identify in the preoperative scan. Make sure that you're, uh, again, using your landmarks. The short posterior ethmoid to maxillary ratio is a, is a, is a nice thing to identify in the preoperative scan. Um, what you see here is a, a short posterior ethmoid with a three to one configuration. And that means that when you're going to go through the basal lamella into the posterior distribution, what can happen is you have, in this scenario, a short uh, normal posterior ethmoid. Here you've got a contracted one, and a, the transition zone of the of the uh, vertical portion and attachment of the uh, basal lamella and the horizontal portion, when you go through, you're very close to the skull base. That's the most common thing. And this, this patient had had, a, uh, again, a fess, and, and someone had got into the, the, the lamina, or I'm sorry, the um, lateral lamella through the short posterior ethmoid. The his and carotid artery, another area to consider, I've seen I've had three patients transferred from other facilities when they had massive bleeding going into the sphenoid. Uh, here's a dehiscent carotid uh, in this large um, a sphenoid here. And the page, all patients had had a carotid rupture from people going through the sphenoid and not actually going through the natural ostia. It's very difficult. Like, so you, if you try and push through bone, and you're, you do not have the reaction time to stop when you push through that bone. And if you're right in line with the carotid, you can seriously injure that carotid. So that's why, from a sphenoid standpoint, I always teach my residents to go through the natural ostia. Very important. Okay, three and a half minutes. OK, great. CSF leak closure. This is something that always people want to talk about because it, it, you know, it's, really, it's, it's going to happen in your career um, if you do a lot of sinus surgery. I've had about a dozen ENTs around the state in Alabama who have called me during cases and, hey, listen, I, I got a leak. I've never had a leak before. What do I do? And it's been really great because I, I lead them through. I'm like, okay, this is what you should do. You know? and, and I'm going to go over that in a second. So intraoperative CSF leak, what do you do? So the first thing you do is stop, reassess where you are, right? So you want to improve your visualization. It usually happens because you got a lot of bleeding or, again, you didn't identify some of those markers like a short posterior ethmoid or... or uh, um, dehiscent skull base. And so um, improve the visualization. Put a, put a patty in, raise the head of the bed to decrease CSF flow, also decrease bleeding. Wait a few minutes, get some hemostasis, and regain your composure. That's the most important thing. Review the CT scan. Where was there a, a dehiscence that you didn't look at, that you didn't identify? Did there, is there a short period post your ethmoid? Are you where you think you are? Remove the packs, clean up around the area. It, the best way to kind of clean up our area is actually use some bipolar. Um, I like a coblator, but a bipolar is fine. But they identify, you, you got to get the bleeding controlled around where the skull base defect is. Uh, you do very, very gentle uh, technique. You can you could then clean up the mucosa around that area because you're going to have to uh, put a patch on. And patches don't take when you have mucosa that's around a defect. You have to, you have to do something like bipolar or, or clean up the mucosa. If you're totally lost, okay, so like you don't know where you are, you're like, oh, it's a, a good bit of bleeding stuff, the wisdom of continuing the surgery could be questions. Um, if you make the decision to repair the leak, again, bipolar, don't get fancy. So one of the things I, I see people do is they try and get fancy. This often turns a defect into a large one. They try and put an underlay in. They're not used to doing this sort of thing, right? So if you're not used to, to repairing CSF leaks, you don't want to be fancy. Use a supportive pack. Just use a simple overlay. Simple repairs are the best. These are low flow, and they're usually small. Okay, they're not high pressure. They're not high flow. They usually a simple repair with a nice supportive pack can really um, can uh, uh, be sufficient to heal these up. You want to monitor overnight. 
okay? Treat this patient like you're, they're your mother, okay? Outpatient sinus surgery, there's a case surgeon disclosed an intraoperative CSF leak, says it's okay since I repaired it, you can go home. Shows up in our ER with a three centimeter cerebral hematoma. They've got um, meningitis, and, uh, and so we've, we've got to deal with the, the complications here. Um, what they did was they actually tried to get fancy. The cartilage graft was in the floor of the nose, and most of the cribiform was removed. I do want to show this because this shows how easily things can happen. This is my case. So a patient had had a septoplasty where they had massive bleeding um, five years ago in Colorado and moved to Alabama. And we identified that actually they had ripped out his cribiform plate and he had a big, massive encephalocele here. Um, just to kind of show you the intraoperative video, I got into the you know, anterior ethmoid, which is not uncommon, right? So I got a little control with a little monopolar cautery here. Usually we use the, the, the coblator and the bipolar function, but we get a control of it. Um, we reduce the rest of the, the brain tissue with with the coblator, and, and, and you can see we've got complete control, right? So there's no bleeding, we reduce it, we're gonna put our repair on. Um, I keep people in a, a monitored setting overnight, such as a neurosurgical ICU, you can, uh, some, something that you can monitor their mental status. Well, you know, he wakes up, he goes to the NICU, but he's got a pretty massive headache. And I get a CT scan of the head, um, typically in the morning, but if they're having symptoms, we get it, and he's got a five centimeter cerebral hematoma. So. He's in, the, he's in the ICU, they put an emergent ventriculostomy, he's in the ICU for, I believe it was around six days with a ventriculostomy, and now we never had to do a crany, and he did fine, but the point is, is that we identified this. And so, my, the, the upshot of all this is that you should take these things seriously, right? You've had a complication, admit the patient, monitor them, monitor their mental status, you know, do the things that are necessary to make sure that they don't have an issue. And I, my time is up, but those are the main points I want to make. Just a quick video. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I use single grafts, typically. This is an ihydrogenic leak that someone had. I cleaned up around the defect with a coblator. I put a, a, a graft in. I did a little underlay and an overlay, but really just an overlay is probably all you need. And then you put in a supportive pack, in this case gel foam, and then I use a little double barrel spacer to provide support. So that's just the techniques that I use. And I will finish there and take any questions that you have. Thank you. <laughs>